morning to you all. What I want to share with you this morning is some uh, information. Uh, it's really to upgrade you on some uh, research that uh, we're involved in right now, myself and uh, some, some others in creationism. And um, in order to do that uh, on the subject of earthquakes, I need to teach you a little bit about earthquakes, which things you may not know, or if you do, just a reminder so that you're, you're up with everybody and understand what I'm about to talk about. So next slide. Uh, begins that process. Earthquakes uh, basically are produced by what I might call jerky motion of rocks against rocks. Uh, a, if you have two rocks that slide against one another smoothly without stopping, you have no earthquake uh, as a consequence of it. It's when two rocks for some reason, either going up or down or splitting apart or moving side to side, some forces are uh, moving the rocks with respect to one another and they get stuck and the, and the energy builds up and then finally breaks. And that break is what causes the earthquake. That isn't the earthquake, that's what causes the earthquake. What happens is some of that energy released at that motion, a very small percentage actually, only a few percent of that energy, is transferred into shock waves that run through the, uh, the rocks, uh, sort of like sound waves moving through the rocks. And there's a tremendous amount of energy involved, and we'll see that in a moment. Next. It's, uh, the, the shock wave reduces in intensity as it goes along, like you might imagine a, a sound wave gets weaker as you get further away. The shock wave from an earthquake gets further, gets weakened as it goes farther from its source. But the earthquake itself is only somewhere between 1 and 10 percent, just a few percent of the actual energy of the, the event itself. And this is, a, this is something I'm going to come back to. The earthquake is only a small little piece of what's really going on. It's evidence of something that's going on, but it isn't the main problem or the main issue. Next. Uh, giving you some idea of the power of earthquakes. Uh, beginning in about 1960, we had developed technology which was capable of estimating the intensity or energy uh, released by the earthquake at its, at its source, at least that percentage of the energy that was put into a shock wave. And we began putting numbers on those things uh, to indicate something of that energy. And we call them, it's a Richter scale magnitude four, for example, has the energy, this is just in the earthquake energy itself. So you multiply this by about 100 for the actual energy at the source. But it's enough energy to power an average house in the United States for seven tenths of a year. It's equivalent to 30,000 sticks of dynamite going off. That's, that's a magnitude four earthquake. That's about the weakest kind of earthquake that you would notice. Uh, that would actually, did you feel something? That kind of thing. Usually doesn't do any damage. It's a really weak earthquake. Magnitude 5 could power the house, just again, the earthquake waves itself, for 21 years and is equivalent to 1 million sticks of dynamite going off. Next. Magnitude 6 powers a house for 664 years, 30 million sticks of dynamite, the equivalent of one atomic bomb. Uh, all the way down to magnitude 9, it's estimated that the energy in the magnitude 9 earthquake could power the average American home for 21 million years. <laughs> uh, it's equivalent to 950 billion sticks of dynamite and 32,000 atomic bombs going off simultaneously. This is, this is a lot of energy involved. The three most powerful earthquakes in, since we've been able to measure it directly, since about 1960, are as follows. Next. Uh, a 9.2 earthquake uh, is estimated to be the power of the Anchorage earthquake of Good Friday uh, 51 years ago in Anchorage, Alaska. It's it was equivalent to something that could power an American house for 241 million years. Two trillion sticks of dynamite going off, 63,500 atomic bombs. The Sumatra 2004 earthquake that created a tidal wave 
a tsunami that killed a quarter million people uh, near Christmas of 2004. 9.3 on the Richter scale. Estimated again to be 359 million years of power for an, for an American home. 2.7 trillion sticks of dynamite, 90,000 atomic bombs. The most powerful one that's been recorded since we have been measuring, since about 1960, is one that occurred in 1960 in, in Chile. Uh, it's uh, 5.1, it's a equivalent to 5.1 billion years of power for a U.S. household. 5.3 trillion atomic, uh, 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 sticks of dynamite, 179,000 atomic bombs. Now again, this is just the power in the earthquake wave, the shock wave. It's, uh, it's approximately 50 times more for the actual energy at the source. So now you got something of an idea of the power involved of the small ones that we've had recently. Next. Now, I'm interested in paleoquakes. That would be earthquakes of the past. So how do you determine an earthquake of the past before you have these uh, measurements? Next, a few me methods. One is movement on either side of a fault. This is like an obvious one. Uh, the one up on the uh, upper left. Oh, I had a pointer. and I'm going to get my pointer. Yay. OK. <laughs> there you see a scarp that occurred on a single earthquake event raised the uh, one side of the road relative to the other side of the road about the height of a car. Here's a fun one. Uh, earthquake that moved things laterally, moved this fence, uh, what is that, about eight feet or so, one side to the other, so they had to extend their fence. Uh, and here's one from the fossil record, uh, a break in the rock that you can tell that uh, this side uh, actually uh, went down with respect to this side and it, dr it drag folded the rocks on one side. So this is kind of an obvious evidence of earthquake activity. But the, the disadvantage with this is that you don't know how much, did this occur in one earthquake or 50 earthquakes? There's a problem there. So there's some ambiguity. Next, another method is shear at the base of rooted objects. So if you have an object at the uh, sticking in the ground. If the ground all of a sudden moves, the, the ground can move fast enough that it'll actually break the object off at the base. The base doesn't have time to respond to the, to the ground. So the, the object still stands there while the ground moves and breaks it off at the base and it falls over. So a classic example is uh, in the middle of the San Francisco earthquake, which is 7.8 on the Richter scale in 1906, a um, statue, similar to this one over here, was standing in this position. It was rooted in place, it was cemented in place, but the earthquake sheared it off at its base and it fell on its face uh, down into the concrete below. This is Louis, a uh, uh, statue of Louis Agassiz, actually. Um, another, other examples, in a uh, cemetery, uh, earthquake moved in such a way both this, uh, this uh, monument and this one moved in such a way that the thing fell off, at least from our perspective in this picture, to the right. That actually tells you something about the motion, which direction the Earth is moving when it first hits. It was moving from the, from the right to the left. And that gives us a tremendous amount of information about a particular earthquake. Next. Another is a collapse of things on slopes, things that are uh, either on a slope that's too high under the earthquake or a slope like this if you got a building. Uh, so, for example, in the 2001 8.4 earthquake in southern Peru, a person took a photograph of one of these towers about to collapse. It's beginning to uh, collapse under its own weight. Here's the 2010 Haiti earthquake, a cathedral. The vertical columns are in place, but the vaulted ceilings, which are basically a slope, collapsed. The largest, lands, the largest landslide observed with uh, a camera uh, it was uh, the 1980 landslide at Mount St. Helens. It was initiated by only a 5.2 earthquake, but it was key. It broke some rocks at the base of the, uh, of the mountain slope, and it caused one cubic kilometer of rock to slide off of the mountain. 
uh, which then initiated the main eruption of uh, Mount St. Helens. Uh, 1959, uh, eight days after I was born, an earthquake 7.3 on the Richter scale in West Yellowstone that, re, uh, that reset Old Faithful's clock so it's no longer Old Faithful, also caused the collapse of this mountainside here, uh, cover, filling this valley with, um, with more than a kilometer, cubic kilometer of rock, uh, which would create an, a lake behind it, uh, built up behind it, earthquake wake, is, lake is what they call it. Army Corps of en Engineers uh, spent the next 30 years cutting through this, uh, this uh, bunch of rock to let the water out before the water went over the top. It took, that <laughs> took 30 years to cut a little notch in something that came down in a, in a second within an earthquake. Next. Another uh, important evidence is the def d distortion of soft sediment, uh, sand or mud or something like that, that is distorted by the shock wave as it comes through. One of the ways is the particles that make up the stuff, like sand, is often not stacked as efficiently as it could be, and so the earthquake shuffles it and lets them settle down to a very efficient packing. That forces water out of the sediment that was once in there. The water going up will bend the sediment above it to produce what we call fluid evulsion structures, and it will also convolute the sediment, causing waviness to the to the uh, sediment. Next. So that, that creates deformation in the sediment. We'll see pictures of that in a bit. And on the surface, next, there'll be li these little volcanoes, the water, water volcanoes. Water will spew out of the ground and uh, flow onto the surface, such as we see here in uh, the dirt came up with the water in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, 6.9 on a Richter scale. Next. Um, it also can fluidize the water. It sends wa uh, the, the sediment, sends water up into the sediment above the, the stuff that's been settled down, and it can, can create something equivalent to quicksand, or actually it's more, uh, it's, it's uh, runnier than quicksand. So you get cars that end up encased in it, buildings that fall into this uh, fluidized sediment. This is uh, liquefaction is what this is called. This is arguably the, the most, uh, causes the most damage in most earthquakes. Now, this is an example from a Japanese earthquake, 1964. Next. Uh, another thing is that earthquakes can actually uh, vibrate the surface and cause things to slowly move down the surface. Uh, this can be in a single earthquake or a bunch of earthquakes so that it causes soil sometimes to move down a slope. Trees that were vertical, the slope has, has gone down and caused the tree to bend. The, bend, the tree then responds by growing uh, further and further upward. So over the course of years and over the course of multiple earthquakes, we have this, uh, this whole slope is sliding down the hillside. Uh, so vibration, you can vibrate loose objects across a surface under the effects of earthquakes. Next. Another thing you can do is a shock wave can actually go through a solid rock and pulverize it. It can actually break it up and what we call brecciate it, break it up into pieces. So a solid, this can only happen to a solid object of some sort and it requires quite an incredible shock wave to take a solid limestone and shatter it. So these are evidences next of, that we can use to detect a, an earthquake of the past. Basically, the bigger this, whatever this thing is, whichever one of these it is, the bigger it is, the more powerful the earthquake. So a small earthquake can break a small, uh, let's say, monument in a cemetery. The larger earthquake can break something more substantial, something that is, that is grounded over a larger area or cemented over a larger area. Um, larger slopes can be brought down by uh, bigger earthquakes. Uh, more significant, thicker pieces of hard sediment can be shattered by bigger earthquakes and so on. So that's the principle we're going we're to use here. Okay, and now you have everything you need to be able to interpret what I'm about to say. Next. And a friend of mine, Stephen Arthur Austin, geologist who's been working in Jordan uh, for the last couple of years studying uh, earthquakes, and he also has an interest in mud. Uh, geologists are weird. Okay, so uh, 
and, and he, it's, this is a quote from him. Dead Sea has the world's best mud. He, that's his personal opinion. He just thinks it's really cool. He's got a smile on his face because he's standing on the Dead Sea with this incredible mud. That's probably not most, what most of you think of when you want to go to see the Dead Sea, but that's what he goes to the Dead Sea to see. Next. And here is what he's talking about. Here's a chunk of that mud from the Dead Sea. Every year, material flows into the Dead Sea. What little precipitation goes into the uh, Dead Sea carries with it uh, mud. And also, the Dead Sea is very, uh, very rich in other minerals that precipitate out of the water and every year produce a layer. In fact, produce two layers. Produce a light layer, a white layer, and a dark layer. And so each one of these alternating bands of light dark represents one year of sedimentation. And this records events from the past. If there, if anything is now the cool thing, the reason it's really interesting in the Dead Sea is because it's the Dead Sea and with high salinity, almost nothing grows in there. Almost no, nothing lives in there. So they don't disturb the sediment down at the bottom. So you have these wonderful layers that aren't destroyed by critters, which are usually, in most environments, they're destroyed by critters. Next. So here's a close-up, and it, it, really astonishing. You can tr carry these things. You can follow these individual layers, literally miles, along the Dead Sea. Next. Um, now, in a portion of the Dead Sea right here, uh, that's, you can see that this area down here has been used by humans uh, to evaporate uh, seawater, the dead seawater, to produce various minerals. And uh, this area was used that way too. Next. In fact, they built a big dike, as you can see right there, and it went right across here, and to hold back a bunch of water for that purpose, but a leak developed in the dike and blew away this entire portion of the dike, ev uh, eroding this entire area. And so that area becomes really nice because the water has cut down through those sediments of the Dead Sea, so you can actually look at them from the side. Next, you'll see there's the old levee. Next. Then you can see for scale, there's a car right there. Uh, so this is a big dike. This is an enormous dike, and it was cut. All the stuff was eroded away by the water that drained that pond. So in this area, uh, Steve has been looking at the sediments. Next. So here's an example. They've cut a, he and a Jordanian geologist have been working together in this project. They've, they've cut into the uh, side of one of these hills that have been cut out in this uh, erosion event. Next. Looking more closely, the layers that are usually very horizontal in, in a couple, in both his hands, are at places where the sediment has been uh, deformed. And we'll look more closely at the lower one. Next. You can see that the, what was, what's usually at the top, flat layers, have been uh, put into nice pretty uh, contortions. And that's due to an earthquake. An earthquake that occurred at the, uh, at the deposition, after the deposition of the last deformed layer, deformed that thickness of sediment. Uh, and the bigger the earthquake is, the deeper it can deform the sediment. So this is a measure, the size of this deformation tells us something about the size of the earthquake. Next. That earthquake corresponds to this one, recorded by Flavius Josephus in the Wars of the Jews, which we know from Roman history occurs at the time of a battle that occurred in 31 BC. And it says in the seventh year of Herod's reign, when the war with Actium was at its height, at the beginning of the spring, the earth was shaken and destroyed an immense number of cattle and 30,000 men. Presumably, you've got an equivalent number of, of uh, women and, and children. So we're talking about a very large earthquake that killed a lot of people. It, it's noted in this account that Herod's army was spared any death because they were out in the open. Nothing collapsed on them. Uh, so they survived the earthquake. Uh, next. We see evidence of the destruction of this earthquake throughout Israel. Uh, and we've been able to, uh, because of the destruction decreases as we get away from the source, we're able to de determine that it was up north of Israel where the earthquake occurred. 
And it amounts to a 10-foot movement, a quick 10-foot movement along 110 kilometers of length on the Jericho Fault. With a magnitude, we estimated about 7.2 on the Richter scale. That turns out to be the largest earthquake in the Israel area for the last 2,700 years. Next. And the, that earthquake uh, broke, uh, among other things, broke the cisterns at Qumran and forced the inhabitants of Qumran to evacuate Qumran. Uh, and that's, so that's got some interesting uh, uh, significance in, uh, in history. Next. That is the, at the bottom here is that 31 BC event. There's another earthquake uh, evidenced here at the 2.81 sign here. And just, uh, I, I verified this, uh, Steve counted this and I did it on, what was it, Tuesday by blowing up this slide and looking at it more closely. I counted the, the, uh, the layers, next. There's 61, 64 layers between the two events, next. And that puts the second event at next, 33 AD. Next, that appears to be the earthquake associated with Christ's uh, crucifixion. Jesus, when he, had cry, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that they're done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. This event, the crucifixion earthquake, uh, has been denied by some people. Uh, but we actually have physical evidence of the earthquake in the Dead Sea sediments. So that's kind of cool. Next. Now, uh, continuing here, uh, there's the 33 AD event. Here's the 31 BC event. There's another one down here where the geologist is pointing. Notice that the deformation there is a whole lot bigger than we have at 31 and, and 33. And that event, next... That one right there, next. Looking at it a little more closely, this several inches. Now the, the 30, 31 uh, BC, 33, yeah, 31 BC event is about four inches high. This one has about eight inches of deformation. Next, we infer that this is Uzziah's earthquake in the middle of the eighth century BC. It's mentioned in the book of Amos, and again, elsewhere, we'll come back to that at the end. The words of Amos, this is the introductory notes in Amos, in the days of Uzziah, so he's dating when, he, when this uh, prophecy came to him. The words of Amos in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, two years before the earthquake. It was apparently a really big earthquake. They, they measured time by it. And in fact, we have evidence of its destruction again throughout Israel. Uh, here's an example of a collapsed wall in Hazor, uh, relatively near the epicenter to the north. Uh, we have all of these sites listed to the left have evidence of destruction from that earthquake in the middle of the 8th century. This one we estimate to be a magnitude of 8 on the Richter scale. We compare, and again, that gives us uh, uh, something like 7 inches of deformation. The Alaskan earthquake of 1964 with a magnitude of 9.2 gave us 11 inches of deformation. So we're talking about, you know, you get 11 inches of deformation if you've got a trillion uh, <laughs> uh, sticks of dynamite going off or uh, whatever it was, 90,000 uh, atomic bombs. This is good for scale now so that we have some idea what kind of power is necessary to produce these effects. Next, um, the, this one is on the Richter scale 16 times more powerful than the 31 BC earthquake and gives the, accordingly a larger impact. Uh, what Steve is now doing is looking back in time, next, he's digging deeper uh, to, we're looking for a, an event 1200 years before this, it's about three centuries after the flood, next, that corresponds to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
We are told in the Bible that Lord, the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. My suspicion is, and Steve's is as well, that there's probably an earthquake associated with this. Uh, whether it's the cause of it or not is a completely different. It, it, there's probably an earthquake, a consequence of this event. Next. Uh, next. Um, in fact, there is a very large earthquake fault that runs along this side to the uh, east of the uh, Dead Sea, causing the Dead Sea, actually. Next, there are five uh, archaeological sites dated from the bronze, uh, early bronze uh, age, that uh, two of which, the, lo the northern two of which, have been excavated fairly well. The others have problems because people have built houses on them and stuff like that. Uh, we believe that these are the five cities of the plain that were destroyed, four of them were destroyed in the earthquake. Zoar, the middle one, Safi, is, uh, is, is the one that was spared because Lot requested to run to that one. Next, the northern one, Bab Ebdra, uh, you see the west gate here. It's interesting, both of these northern two cities have two destruction zones. One that's a few decades before the other. The second one completely obliterates the, sec the Numira. Uh, and the, this one here, they try rebuilding afterwards for a little while and then give up. Uh, but the second, the second event really finished them off. The first event seems to correspond to the attack on Lot uh, during the days of Abraham. And then the second one it appears to be an event where Everything in the city collapsed, the wall collapsed, and the houses are burnt from the top down. Uh, the, and so it's, it, there's no evidence of a military incursion, so it appears to be uh, fitting the description of the event in, in, as it's described in the Bible. Next, at Namira, here are a couple of examples of people uh, that were left there, burned, in the process of the burning of the city. It was so rapid that not only did it burn down the buildings, but it burned the people in place uh, in that location, never to be, and again, that site was never uh, re-inhabited. Uh, so we think we have the uh, site of God, Sodom and Gomorrah. It fits archaeological, everything fits except one thing. Uh, carbon dating on this indicates that these things are too old uh, by centuries. But as a young age creationist, this doesn't surprise me one bit because I understand that carbon-14 dating would give you too old an age at that time. And so I'm expecting that it should be younger. So now we have a method when Steve, looking at the sediments from the Dead Sea here, finds this earthquake, which I think is going to be associated with an earthquake, he can count the, the, uh, the, the layers and determine the, the date of this event. And we have then a way to uh, reevaluate carbon-14 and to uh, establish or confirm that these are actually the Sodom and Gomorrah events. Next. Uh, so, uh, I, I think this, this is exciting research. He's, he's in, he went last summer, he's going this, this next summer, uh, hoping to uh, 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 seal that particular argument. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen. Next. Now, those, those are archaeological uh, earthquakes. I'm interested in older ones than that. And so we're going to move back one or two centuries uh, another century or two in time before the time of Abraham, which I'm thinking is probably a couple centuries after the flood, maybe as, as recently as one. Next, now we get to evidence of an earthquake of massive proportions. Here is a, uh, something called the Kingston Range in California, seen on Google Earth here. It's uh, about 15, 13 by 15 miles in size. This is a, is a mountain range without roots. This is crazy. Mountains, um, in order for something to stick up above the ground, there's got to be something underneath the ground holding it up. It's like, a, well, how could a ship float on water unless there's something underneath the surface of the water uh, supporting it? You need a root. You need a keel, if you wish. 
Mountains, in order to exist above the surface, have to have a keel of low, low uh, density stuff to hold them up. It's just the way it works. If you don't do that, the mountain will sink, if it's got the same density as the surrounding rocks, the mountain will simply sink to the level of everything else. And it takes about 30,000 years to do so. So if the earth is really old, uh, and these events occurred millions of years ago, which is the traditional dating, then this mountain chain should not be here. It should have sunk beneath the surface because seismic evidence indicates that there's no, there's no root underneath it. It's the mountain sitting literally on top of the ground, which is crazy. That can't happen unless it's very recently been put in place, something significantly less than 30,000 years ago. Not only that, but we found where it came from. We found the roots, because in the center of this, this high peak here is Kingston Peak granite. It's got a very particular chemistry that is unlike the chemistry of any other granite in the earth, and we found that granite's chemistry where it came from. This mountain chain came from 40 miles away. Next. This mountain chain was sheared off from its roots <laughs> and then vibrated across the landscape for 40 miles. Next. What? Are you kidding? What kind of an earthquake could do that? Break a 15 mile wide, 5,000 foot high. That's the height of the, the thing above. 5,000 foot high, 15 miles wide. Break it off and then blah, 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 vibrate it across the landscape. For 40 miles? Are you kidding? What kind of an earthquake is that? Again, scaling it from what we've been talking about, this is actually the secular scientists call it out of this world. It is, in their opinion, impossible for an earthquake of that magnitude to have, exist, to have occurred on this planet without the influence of something from outside of this planet, which I completely agree with. But they have a different sort of outside influence. They would suggest that the only thing powerful enough would be an asteroid that comes and hits the earth and hits it with such intensity that it breaks the mountain off and vibrates it across the landscape. The problem with that, well, uh, one problem with that hypothesis, among many, is this is not the only one. Every, as near as we can tell now, we haven't done it with every single mountain because there are lots of them, but in San Diego County, which has the size of a small state in the eastern United States, Every single mountain is out of place. Every single mountain has been sheared from its base and vibrated away, miles away from where it came from. On the San Andreas Fault, everything's been vibrated away from the San Andreas Fault. The closer it was to the San Andreas Fault, the farther it's been vibrated away from it. And we're talking about tens of miles. The Coronado Islands in San Diego are not supposed to be there. They are, they are supposed to be 10 miles inland, uh, and they've been broken off and vibrated. To, this is no, this isn't a single asteroid. You can't do that. It would suggest that the movement along the San Andreas Fault and the earthquakes along that fault must have been many orders of magnitude greater than they are today. We argue, and I argued last year at, at chapel, we have a theory that suggests that plate tectonics actually occurred during the flood three billion times faster than it's occurring today. That kind of motion would explain this. No other motion can. Next. That's not all, because we can get bigger ones. Next. Going back a little bit, this was my discovery last summer. <laughs> this is so much fun. <laughs> This is a fluid, this is soft sediment deformation. I said that the, the Alaskan earthquake of 1964 produces 11 inches of deformation. A 9.2 earthquake with 11 inches of deformation. I've seen in the literature, I've been trying to dig up all the examples, people have found three feet of deformation. Secular scientists have found three feet of deformation said, this is unearthly. This cannot happen on this planet. This kind, this size earthquake can only be explained by an asteroid impact. Okay, three feet. This is six feet. 
of deformation at this one. This is what I found on the first day, and it's the small one. Next. Here's another one with two, uh, with, in fact, this area's got five meters of deformation. What? How do you do that? Next, it gets bigger. And next, bigger. I, I don't know how big they're going to get. Not only that, there's not just one, like one asteroid impact that kills the dinosaurs. I've got one right at the end of the dinosaurs. Right at the extension, extinction of the dinosaurs, I've got one of these things. But not the big one, it's one of the little ones. <laughs> I've, got, I've got five of them that I've, I've established. I've, I've got a half a mile of sediment to look through, and I've only looked through 800 feet of it so far, and found five of them. I suspect that I'm going to find somewhere around 20 or 30 of them. This means every 80 feet of sediment, we have a, an earth-shattering event. An event that would send a shockwave across the planet. You would feel it every continent of the planet. Not just here, but every continent. My suspicion is, this week, that the, the cause of this is that rapid plate tectonics is, is uh, sending uh, the ocean crust beneath North America to the west of here about 800 miles. 800 to 1,000 miles west of here, we've got the, uh, the, the, the plate going down very quickly, and it's got islands stuck on it. The islands can't sink with the plate. They get smashed up against the continent as the plate goes down. And I believe each smashing event of a state-sized uh, uh, island actually sends a shockwave across the North American continent to produce these structures. A thousand miles away, uh, we're seeing these kinds of structures. And it's happening apparently every few minutes or hours uh, during the period of this deposition. This is the same period of time the dinosaurs are getting buried. This is, I think, not a series of 80 asteroids uh, in sequence, but one flood event. One event that God designed to destroy all life on the surface of this planet. Next. It's really the only way to explain it. Here's another example, uh, another type of example from the Grand Canyon. Uh, you see this line right here. Next. That corresponds to a fault. And if we look at the rocks just to the left of the fault in that canyon. Next. This is Carbon Canyon. You see that the rocks have been folded, and, and next to show how they've been folded, they've been recumbently folded next to the fault. The fault has one mile of displacement. The tsunami of 2004 that killed a quarter million people was 60 meters of motion. 60 meters of motion, uh, 200 feet, let's say, of motion. This is one mile of motion and it folds rocks. <laughs> By the way, scale, there's a person right there. He's about that high. Uh, he's, can't see, it's just really small. These are huge. This is an enormous earthquake that occurred, evidenced in the Grand Canyon. Next. And then here's another fun one, brecciated sediment. Rats. Um, uh, oh, skip it. Don't have time. This is cool. That's evidence of a shockwave that moved across the entire continent, breaking solid rock as it went. Uh, um, astonishing stuff. Next. Now the big one. And what I believe is the biggest of them all. At the beginning of the flood, it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, same day, were all the fountains of the great deep across the entire planet broken up. This, I believe, to have been an earthquake that is the biggest earthquake in, in history of the world. Next. Uh, for several years, I studied the rocks in the Kingston Range. Besides the Kingston Range itself, I was looking at the rocks composing them, surrounding the Kingston Peak Granite. And there's what we call a diamictite. It's a rock made of uh, sand, basically, with some, with some uh, bigger rocks stuck into it, like you can see here. But some of the big rocks are really big. These are little rocks. Next. 
This rock is a quarter mile in diameter. It took Steve and I uh, almost a week walking over this thing to figure out, wait a minute, this is one rock. One rock in this diamictite. Next, that turned out to be the little one. Here is uh, from Google Earth, pretty cool. Um, you've got pictures of one, two, three, four, five, six, six rocks in this larger rock that are a mile in diameter. They're like uh, dinner plates. They're about a mile in diameter and several hundred meters thick. These are rocks that broke off of some source and rolled into this position in an avalanche. It's an avalanche that left uh, two miles of, uh, of sediment and mile-long rock fragments in it. Next. I interpret, and, and if you trace it, this is this little triangle down here that I just showed you, uh, you, you trace the same sediments, same age, all over the world, except they're not exactly all over the world. They turn out to be on the edge of the continent that, uh, that I, I believe was on the earth just before the flood. So what this is, I believe, these are the collapsed, this is the collapsed continental margin. The earthquake that began the flood collapsed the edges of the world's, all the world's continents. <laughs> it's probably an earthquake that began at one of these places and moved at the speed of sound, and it would have taken five hours to do its work. It took, uh, it, usually an earthquake is 20 seconds, 45 seconds for a monster earthquake. This one would have lasted for five hours. Moving at the speed of sound, cracking the surface of the earth over a total of 50,000 miles, it collapsed the edges of the continents around the world. The biggest earthquake, I believe, in, US, in, in, in the earth's history. Next. Next. When we graph these things, what, I, what seems to be the beginning of the flood are the very, the very biggest earthquake of all. By the, in the middle of the flood, we have monstrous earthquakes, unearthly uh, uh, by orders of magnitude, more than anything we have in the present. By the end of the flood, we're still having earthquakes that are unearthly in proportion, but weaker. And in the present, we're still suffering from earthquakes, a consequence of the flood. They're just leftover, tiny little leftover earthquakes from the flood itself. Next. So what we have geologically, we're still in the flood. Next. What we see today, when we see the incredible destruction of an earthquake, we're seeing a tiny, tiny picture of the fury of God's wrath against human sin. We're still feeling the effects of this. Today, 4,500 years after the flood, we're still seeing small residual effects of the fury of God's anger against human sin. Do you think God takes sin seriously? I'd say there's very good evidence that he takes it very, very seriously. And remember, too, these earthquakes are just a small fraction of the power that generated them. They're only the surface evidence of something bigger that is behind them. When we're looking at that massive power of the flood, there's something behind that that's many times larger than that. That's the real cause of the earthquakes. Next. And God promised that he'd never destroy the earth with a flood again. But he did promise he's coming back, and he's coming back in judgment. The same God who is angry at sin and destroyed the surface of the earth at the time of the flood is coming back again. And here's what the scriptures say. His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Half of the mountain will move to the north, half to the south. There's a valley going to occur between them. Whoa, talk about, that's bigger than anything I have been showing you. <laughs> that's an enormous earthquake. You shall flee like you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. That huge earthquake in the days of Uzziah that I referred to before. That's going to happen. And I suspect it's going to be soon. Next, are you ready for that judgment? God has made a way for you to avoid that. Just as he did in the days of Noah, 
He gave an opportunity for people to get onto the ark so they could avoid the judgment upon sin. Only eight people out of millions did so. The rest felt his wrath and were destroyed by it. Today, God offers Jesus Christ as the ark of salvation through the judgment that is to come. With his forgiveness, you will not feel the wrath of God, which is coming, guaranteed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you for being the awesome, amazing God that you are. I thank you for the truth of your word, that we can use it to better our science, to we can use it to better understand the world about us. But most importantly, we know from your word of the salvation that you offer to everyone. The ark of salvation through the fury that is to come. We've seen the evidence of the fury. We know the complete destruction that will result from your fury. We also know that your love makes a way for us to avoid it. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here who has never accepted what is offered to them in the blood of Christ, that today they would get on the ark of salvation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.